Hi, everybody. I'm Peter Deer, CEO of the WMHI. I'm here with Emmy Golding, the Director of Psychology. We happen to be married, but that's not why we're here. The reason I'm here today is to tell you that I come from a long line of warriors. No, no, not this type of warriors, but the type that worries a lot. We have a PhD in negative thinking, going generation after generation. PhD in negative thinking. I was so good. Ever since I was a child, I could walk into a room and notice anything that was wrong with that room, or even slightly dirty. In fact, my mother used to tell me a story, which I don't actually remember because I was so little, in which she took me to a friend's place, and the friend was offering me biscuits, you know, chocolates or something, and I would keep de declining them. And my mom, when she came out, she said, why did you decline everything that lady gave you? And I, and, I, and I said as a child, because everything was so dark, meaning dirty. As a little child, <laughs> I was already so aware of that. Well, do you think that I grew up as a very happy child or as a very anxious child? I grew up as a very anxious child. And my relationship to the world was not a good one. I could hardly go out the door. I could hardly have friends. I could hardly relax to go out and make friends, let alone go to school. That was a horrible, horrible experience. And if you see pictures of me when I was little, very often I have dark undertones under my eyes and <laughs> not a very happy look to me. I've changed. I've grown up. But anxiety sucks. It ruins part of your life. But it doesn't have to end your life. And this is why we are talking about anxiety today. We want to talk to people about what is anxiety? How do we know if we have it? What are the symptoms of it, right? Signs and symptoms. And what can we do about it? Is that right? But we do want to talk about, about uh, anxiety because it's the number one mental health issue around the world. So the research, it differs a little bit from country to country. But uh, in the U.S., they're saying 19% of adults experience anxiety each year. Severely. Anxiety enough that it could be classified as a disorder, that right. it could be diagnosed, because a little bit that's, of anxiety is normal. Big. That's 19% of the population is One huge. in five. And I that's, mean, that's, that eliminates people that have got high anxiety, but it couldn't be diagnosed. They're, they're kind of handling it, but it's yeah. still horrible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a little bit of anxiety is normal. and yeah, We all have some. We want to have some. If you don't have any anxiety, then that actually becomes a problem because you're not safe. But that's another story. This is severe anxiety, the kind that you're describing here, which you had for about 40 years, I think you said. Oh, I, I grew up with it, a huge sense of dread. Mm -hmm. That obviously made me very sick. I had asthma. Um, I developed rashes because that's what happens with anxiety. I remember when I was uh, in my early teens uh, developing huge stomach pains, mm -hmm. really, really bad stomach pain. I remember when, when I first went to, to take, to do my license, to, dr to drive, license, yeah. I got so sick. I got <laughs> so sick. I could barely move in the stomach and it was all nerves. All yeah. Nerves. So it was, it was very, very disruptive. It, it was, yeah. it's not a nice experience. That's why I like to help people get, get, yeah. get a handle on it. And it makes such a big difference to the quality it, of your life. It does. And, and, you know, it's it's I laugh now because yeah. you're so much the opposite. You've learned how to overcome yeah. that completely. But yeah. but the impact I think is often underestimated. I, I've worked with a lot of young people, especially that are really struggling with it, and it impacts their schooling, it impacts their social situations, you know, uh, yeah. and it has a flow on effect going forward as well. So it's something that we definitely want to nip in the bud and address as soon as possible. And one so, of the questions that a lot of our audience have, uh, you know, people have asked us in training as well is, is it worse now than ever before? Or has it always been this way and we just didn't talk about it? You know, as having been now a few decades, at least three decades of serving um, from a mental health perspective, the world mm -hmm. and trends, I have to say that the last three years, ever since we, since we got locked down because of the pandemic, the rates of... Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the signs in people of anxiety, mm -hmm. irritability, frustration, the willingness to have lash out at people, mm. 
definitely has tripled or quadrupled. Absolutely. And we're getting reports from other psychologists around the world yeah. saying the same thing. It's not, yeah. not just us. It's no, not just no, no. our own anecdotal no. evidence. But um, definitely we have seen an increase. Not just individual anxiety. I, have, I also have a pulse on the collective mm. or global anxiety. Mm. And we definitely, there's, there's not, there hasn't been a moment when we have not been bombarded by a crisis. Yeah. If it's not, if it's not, um, the virus, it's the flu. If it's not the flu, it's Ukraine. If it's not Ukraine, it's Gaza. If it's not Gaza, it's cows farting and ruining the planet. There's something all mm -hmm. the time yeah. trying to get our attention and freak us out. Mm. And I'm seeing this, uh, had a conversation just this week with a manager at a call center and they want to upskill their staff around how to um, handle their own emotions when people are screaming down the phone at them because so many of those customer-facing roles are seeing increased levels of irritability and aggression and anger from people, which we know is anxiety-related. They want to know how do we not let us affect us so we can keep doing our job. That's but true. One, we have had a, an, an inordinate uh, amount of inquiries from call centers. Lately. Yes. Yeah. And customer yeah. facing roles, retail, yeah. et cetera, yeah, yeah. anywhere where you're dealing with the public. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, one of the things he said is that some of the research that they've done has found out that in election years, it's worse. Right. And this goes to the core of anxiety. It's about doubt. It's about fear. It's about uncertainty. And haven't we have a, have had a lot of that over the last few years? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I thought that was very interesting data. Election mm. years, and this is one. Oh yeah. You know, this for, is an election year. So for the US anyway, which impacts the rest of the world. So, yeah. mm. um, something to be aware of. Mm. There's definitely a higher levels of anxiety, and people are watching. I mean, we've got. Right here in Europe, we have mm -hmm. the, the farmers yeah. on the streets right yes. now in almost talk every of, country. Talk of food yeah. shortages, that Talks sort of, of thing. Food shortage, water shortages, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know. So there's, there's a lot of things in people's minds that it's logical is going to be driving their anxiety. We do think that there is a very real increase in the amount of anxiety. There is also more awareness and there there is also lowered criteria, but I think it's both and happening here. That's yeah. my assessment of the situation. The, the umbrella for the diagnosis of, um, of anxiety has become bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so more can be included. Uh, we are more aware. We are more likely to say we're stressed. Mm -hmm. And when people say I'm stressed, it means they're experiencing anxiety. Yeah. It's another word for anxiety. So people are, are more likely to use the word stress rather than pressure, which is a problem. Mm. Uh, and I talk about that in another video. Is it stress or is it pressure? Yeah. Um, but it, even, even with those distinctions, I think we still have more anxiety. Yeah. And what are some of the common misconceptions about anxiety? Because for those who don't experience it, it's very easy to say, oh, well, just, you know, get over it or put it out of your mind yeah. or, you know, don't worry about the things, 95% of them are never going to happen. I mean, all of that sounds, it's true, It's but. I think, I think for me the biggest misconception of people, I mean, there's many, but the biggest one, the number one misconception that people have is that anxiety, that they shouldn't have any anxiety. Mm. Okay. Anxiety is a natural emotion. Mm. It's there to protect us. If, you know. A mother is supposed to experience some anxiety about where her baby that is just starting to crawl is putting their fingers. Yes. That is normal. That is good. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not normal if she can't sleep because she's freaking out about the baby dying next to her. <laughs> that, that's become a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, you know, at a normal level a of anxiety, of it's, it's fine. And uh, so how do you know what's normal and what's not? It's, are you able to function? Is this serving yeah. you or yeah. is it? getting in the way of good functioning. By the so. way, the other misconception is that anxiety is a force on its own and people have no control. Mm. As an anxiety PhD self-suffering expert, mm. I can guarantee you the anxiety was mostly created by me not controlling how I was looking at the world. Mm. Okay, that was one aspect. The other aspect had to do with the food that I was getting that it was impacting my gut. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of, of both. Mm -hmm. But the number one was my mindset and how I was looking at the world. Mm -hmm. So 
anxiety is not is not a monster that has a that has a grip over you mm. it's a tool that your we are not using uh, adequately yeah. and this is really important um, i remember an interaction i saw in a workplace recently because it can be something as simple as the language that we use around anxiety and what happened was the manager was you know very much aware of mental health and well-being which is great and fantastic and they knew that this staff member had problems with anxiety from time to time and so compassionately very caringly and you know she was checking in with this staff member every day how's your anxiety today and it was meant to be supportive but as a psychologist I looked at this and went ah okay if you really yeah. understand what's going on here yeah what we're doing is you're encouraging the worker to check in physically and mentally internally for them and go, where, where is, first of all, my anxiety as if it's like something that you own and that you cling to and that it is, is almost a part of you. And so where is it at today? And immediately you start looking for it and you start searching. Oh, there it idea. is. As, you know, what you look for, you'll find. That's so, a bad idea. <laughs> so there it is. Oh, yes. And today it's at a seven or it's an eight or it's a 10 or it's a four or whatever it might be. But immediately you start over monitoring it and that's going to make it worse for the person. Not just that, but then they start talking about it. And so they get to have a lovely, you know, conversation, rapport building conversation between the two, but you emphasize it by focusing on it. Hmm. So we, one of the things we, we did was sort of educating the manager around what are other ways that you can show that support and show that care that aren't going to actually make the anxiety worse for the person. Um, so it's a real change in thinking that's mm. required sometimes, but just yeah. something as simple as the language that we use can yeah. have a big impact. And it, it, I think not a day goes by when I talk to a manager that is having problems with their staff in which I walk away thinking that at least 20% of 10 to 20%, not a lot, mm. but just some key words they're using on an everyday basis is yes. contributing to the negative results yeah. that they're getting. Yeah. They're really good managers. Yes. Yeah. They're really good managers. And, caring. That they, and beautiful people that care because otherwise they wouldn't be talking to me yeah. or even putting up with me because I talk very frankly. Um, so these are, these are really good people and really skillful, really prepared, but they have a blind spot. Yeah as to certain words that they're using that is contributing to the anxiety of the team. And you don't know what you don't know. No, you don't know. And this um, is where we come in yeah. to train them. Yeah. And, and they do. And this is why people report such good results from mm. our, from our workshops mm -hmm. because they walk away saying, oh, simple was, changes that I can make yeah, that are going to have a big impact. I can't believe I was team. using these words and, or I was thinking this way. So you said before, you know, sometimes people say, you know, 95% of the things that you're afraid of don't come true. And if you say that flippantly, that's a bad thing to say. But you know what? That was a very useful thing for me. Mm -hmm. To It was a sobering thought because what am I afraid about? You know, if most of the things I'm afraid about won't come true, why do I even give them time or space? Mm -hmm. You know, so that was... Deal with them when they happen, yeah. if they happen. You know? If they happen, but they're most mm -hmm. likely not going to happen ever. Mm -hmm. And and a, another a coach once help me sober up a little bit because I was think he says think of, I was talking about a problem. He said, okay, well let's say that what you are afraid of happens. Exactly how mm -hmm. you're thinking. What then? Okay, okay. <laughs> he said, and what's the problem then? Oh. And I thought, oh okay. I, I I hadn't thought about that one. I was focusing on the first problem, but not if it actually happened. So I thought, okay, well I guess if that problem happens I'll be destitute, I'll be on the street. And he continued, and what's the problem then? Mm. Oh, shit, I hadn't thought about that yeah. one. Um, so if I'm destitute, I guess I'll look for a bridge. Okay, so what's the problem to then? sleep under. <laughs> sleep under. Well, the first, <laughs> but I don't, I mean, I'm exaggerating. I could, I could go to a friend's house. I'm sure for one night that would be okay. Yeah. So I started finding yeah. solutions to this the worst the problem that could happen. This is what we, and it was great. We do the what if exercise. Yeah. And so mm. what if that does happen? What if? What's your, mm. Oh, well, I have a plan. Because what if I lose my job? Well, I would get another one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it might even be better than the last one. And, and people, too often we end at what if and we don't actually answer the question. The question. We just say, what if? Oh, with the, and then anxiety mm. instead of actually going, oh, okay, I have a plan now if that was to happen. Yeah. So I, I've 
And Absolutely. then I can put it aside. Yeah. But this is interesting. That ability to put it aside is is crucial because, uh, and this kind of relates to some of the gender differences that we see. So st- statistically speaking, um, women tend to experience more anxiety than men. Now there's questions around is it just women are more likely to talk about it or to express it in a way where they get a diagnosis. But let's say for let's say that it is a real uh, significant difference in the actual experience of anxiety. We also know that the way women's brains work, there's more connections between the different parts of the brain. So one topic relates to another, relates to another, relates to another, and it's very easy to get caught in these rumination patterns. Yeah. Whereas men, and I'm speaking generally here, yeah. of course, there's yeah, always course. exceptions, men generally are better able to compartmentalize and put something in a box and file it away. That's actually a really good skill that could benefit all of us to learn yeah. how to do that. Now, of course, sometimes we need to go and open the box again and do some work with it. But that ability to focus your mind on where you want it to go, I think, is the core of dealing with anxiety. Mm. See, this is where I was failing most of my life. (laughs) If I was anxious, I couldn't even sleep. I was not able to compartmentalize anything, Mm -hmm. you know, so it would would all get mangled up, you know. And that's why the the anxiety. Yes, absolutely. And this is the challenge because sometimes it's everything is easier said than done. But it's a practice and it can be achieved. It's absolutely and, a practice. I mean, yeah. someone who's in the, the grips of an, a panic attack and anxiety to say, you know, control yourself, mm. you know, that's not going to help. But outside of those states, practicing that ability to direct your attention to, all right, I'm going to lean into the what if question or I'm going to stay present in the here and now or, to be able to direct that focus is mm. crucial. Mm. And, and, you know, from life experience, I'd have to say, that there's no silver bullet mm. and there's nothing, not a complete wrong way to do it. I have seen some people react really well from somebody coming and say, stop it right now. And they've gone, the shock, okay, <laughs> the shock, the shock factor have stopped them. It's a pattern you know? interrupt. And some people go, that would never work. That would make it worse. Yeah. Well, some people that would make it worse, but for some people it works. Mm. So don't, don't knock anything out. Yeah. Because it doesn't work for you. It doesn't mean it doesn't work for the rest of humanity. Yeah. It just means it doesn't work for you. Find something else. Or it doesn't work for you at this point in time. Yeah, that's right. Because sometimes that's something you've support. tried before mm. didn't work then, but it does now yeah. because things change. We change. To, to me, the miracle thing for me, uh, if I have to look at one thing that has helped me, uh, was gratitude lists. Mm. I did them for five years straight mm-hmm. every single night. Mm-hmm. And that was a game changer because mm-hmm. it taught my brain to focus on the nice things in a room, the nice <laughs> things in people, the nice things in life. And, and studies have shown Oft. that the moment that you teach your brain to focus on the nice things, yeah. it forgets how yeah. to do anxiety so yeah. well. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Absolutely. You know? That's, so that's what worked with me. Some people say, Oh, I hate gratitude list. Well, well and it's sounds- you hate them, but. But so that works for me. It yeah. sounds so simple and so cheesy, but it's like it's proven. Not. It's hardcore evidence. Hardcore psychology behind this. it, right? Do it with your kids. Mm. Let's not also forget the biological, the physical aspects, both yeah. internal and external. You know, diet has a huge role to play. Hormones have a huge role to play. Maybe that's part of the male-female differences there as well in how we experience anxiety at least because I think my suspicion is men do also – experience a lot of anxiety they just express it and show it differently or Mm. they express it and show it less Um, but i think and i do think it's different between the sexes but i've also want to draw attention to the role of you know when when women are are at certain times in their cycle yeah and there's a lot of people that again we don't talk about it much because it's kind of personal but there's a lot of women that really will acknowledge to themselves like at certain times in my cycle I feel highly emotional. Is highly that your stressed. experience too? Oh no, not me. Never. I'm I'm perfect <laughs> and uh, always balanced and reasonable. Always, always. And yeah, I'm talking but about that, other it, women. But the anxiety grows up. You, you notice that? Oh yeah. You know, well, I, mm. most people will say they can notice. I know you, you know, can handle it, but irritabi- I mean, yeah. irritability is a big oh, right, one okay. that's related with anxiety. So stress levels rise. It comes out in irritability, normally mm. with those closest to us. Um, and some women do seem to be more susceptible to it than others. And yeah. if you are one of those people, then you've probably got an awareness of it and you've got to be yeah. able to coach yourself through those 
periods and saying, you know, this is just going to be, you know, just got to take it easy on myself for the next couple of days, you know. And That's very really insightful because I'd never thought about it that way because as guys, every guy that I talk to that is in a relationship, we we experience the irritability, right? <laughs> but we never, I never thought, and we've never discussed it, that it might be an issue of fear behind that, like anxiety. I'm worried oh, yeah. about something and I can't express it, so I lash out. But not necessarily that you be worried about something, just physically, physically your body anxious. is giving you those those right, chemicals and those signals and those hormones that you're on edge so that something that exists in the out the dishes right. not being washed for example or yeah. something small you're layering it on top of that I'm already on edge and now there's this and I'm already on edge and now there's that and and, right. and so it comes it overwhelms your your system so what do you find that helps then in in that situation just waiting or well the the mental stuff that we've spoken about the patience the tolerance um you know don't make a decision in a crisis is mm. one of the sayings we have in psychology so mm. um you know being aware and having a supportive network around you you know where if people know what's going on they can say oh, all right i'm not going to react to that person quite so much you know never say <laughs> never say it but just know it mentally right. all right yeah. i'm just gonna be patient with this because i know it's not the norm i know yeah. you know so. well i've never experienced a period in my life so i can't speak from experience <laughs> but i have experienced uh, anxiety and delusions because i eventually was diagnosed with uh, bipolar depression i had delusions uh, severe enough in which my technique was to rely on a trusted friend, mm. somebody that could tell it to me straight. So if I'm thinking, oh, this person is a, whatever paranoid thought was, was invading my mind or I was producing my mind at the time, mm -hmm. I could trust that this person would give me good little advice saying, no, don't worry. Mm. It's not exactly like you see it. Mm. It's just, just wait mm. and it'll be okay. Yeah. And, and that was very useful. So maybe oh, oh, yeah. sleep on it, isn't sleep that? On it, yes. so, I mean, it's don't don't make a decision wisdom. in a crisis. Just sleep, sleep on it. Sleep on it, you know. Mm. And and but I can't sleep. <laughs> 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 Why do I do this? Oh, when, in the that's in a big the, one. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. For me, uh, I tried Valium, Temazepam, which is stronger than Valium. Uh, just doubled the doses, and I didn't like the feeling of it. It did mm. help me sleep, but it was a very interrupted sleep. I tried drinking that, that didn't help very much because it's interrupted drinking. So I, I moved on to meditation, mm. uh, gratitude lists, breathing, mm. brain entrainment technologies is where you put that's... sounds. I tried everything. Mm. Chamomile, three or four bags of chamomile. <laughs> that different things works on different nights, you know, sometimes even, even making sure that you're not too hungry before mm. going to bed. Yeah. Um, helps and I think on top of that is you, you don't layer it so and by that I mean don't get anxious about the feelings of anxiety because then you've got two layers yeah. of anxiety yeah so or, or about not sleeping, or about not sleeping so it's yeah. like you know what I'm doing this I'm doing this I'm doing this and just uh, the ability to kind of accept mm -hmm. not being at a hundred percent yeah and say there's nothing more I can do at this point. It's okay. There's no point being stressed about your anxiety and then and layering and, and it up. And you just said something that reminded me, this idea of being at 100%. I was always a perfectionist. Mm, that's a big one. Yeah, if you're a perfectionist, you think that there's this ideal feeling that you should be living in. Mm. After many decades of life, I can guarantee you there's no such thing. Mm. Nobody ever feels 100% mm -hmm. unless they're on drugs, <laughs> and that we do not recommend them. <laughs> but nobody feels at 100%. It's not possible. You know, the, the, there's right now in my life, I'm at a stage when I wake up and there's always something mm -hmm. hurting, mm -hmm. you know, but it's still a good day. <laughs> yeah. You know, a good day is not something where everything is perfect. Yeah. A good day is a day where you focus on the perfect. But I've heard myself saying something, and it feels like some of that, all that, that ancient wisdom from our grandmas is yeah. actually so relevant. You know, I said to our son the other day, okay, you had a bad day today. Tomorrow yeah. could be better. Yeah. And it's so simple, but we forget that sometimes. It's okay to go, well, today today wasn't the best, but that's okay. Tomorrow wake up again. Tomorrow's a new day. Mm. Tomorrow can be better. 
Having said that, even within those bad days, if you can find something good, the, the silver lining from the day, you know, at least I was able to get out and go for a walk. At least I I went to the gym. At least I did something. At well, least. that's where gratitude list helped yeah. me a lot because it helped me re- realize of the thousands of little good things that are in every day. And even in a shitty day, mm-hmm. they're there. Yeah. They're there. And when you start realizing of how much goodness, how much good stuff is surrounding you every day, that's when the negative things take a, a, a second place. You know? yeah. So, so yeah. I hope there's something useful in there for you. Yeah. Uh, let us know which piece you like the best, what, what strategies you use. Yeah. yeah. Remember, we're not perfect. We deal with the same things that you deal, <laughs> except you. Um, we deal, you deal with every day. We just work on it every day and we encourage you to do the same. You know, take care of yourselves, uh, love yourselves and love each other and we love you. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.